so good to see a full room be surrounded by Devin's work. Um, this is really exciting. I'm glad we were able to make this happen. So welcome, welcome. Um, so I just wanted to begin with a very general question about your practice, how you arrived at your practice. Um, I'm gonna keep it general to start off to ask what made you decide to become an artist? And after you made that decision, what was it that you wanted to do or say through your work? Do you want me to go first? Yes, okay. I do. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, thanks for the question. So I um, grew up in Philly, and I, uh, from a very young age, was uh, kind of pushed into whatever kind of extracurricular activity that, that I showed any remote interest in. and. Both of those things ended up being, I played um, instruments when I was younger, classical instruments, so I was in orchestra. I played violin and viola since uh, probably about the age of five or six. Um, and then I also was drawing all of the time. And so um, my family would kind of like make sure that I was in classes for those things. And so I kind of grew up doing both um, up until I got to the point where I was like, okay, I kind of should pick one if I want to really hyper focus. And I chose art just because I felt like I had a little bit more autonomy in deciding, um, just in the way that I was raised and the way that I was taught music was very much like playing other people's and not so much writing. Um, I took some music theory, but it really didn't catch in the same way. And um, yeah, and so with art, I, um, I actually changed my major when I was in college from, I didn't even start as an art major or a music major. I started in uh, life sciences just because I was like, okay, this is something that I'm good at and I can understand how a career path or trajectory works. And then eventually I was like, I hate this. It's very hard. Um, and then I just changed my major to uh, drawing and painting at Penn State and then went from there and was like, I don't know how you can be an artist as a career, but I'll hopefully figure it out. Somebody can maybe tell me some pro tips. <laughs> um, yeah, and then I, I sort of did that route through education, um, higher education and figuring out how to be an artist. I, I know there's plenty of other people who take different routes to that, but that was where I learned um, how to be an artist in the way at least that I've arrived at it today. Um, thank you for having me and thank you for being here. Um, I think for me, as a kid, I always utilized art as a way to tell stories and express myself, and then um, and went to a, like a very artsy high school. Um, and then when I went to college, right outside of high school, I didn't think art was viable. Like I didn't think I could actually like make a living. Um, and I also thought it weirdly was like selfish, which I don't think now. Um, but like I felt like I had to do something that was like like a, be a social worker or something and. And so um, I didn't take any art classes. And then um, I had a baby and I like had a very different life where I was making art and um, like sort of like community at like events or something. Um, and then after like many years of like working at a movie theater and doing childcare, I was like, oh, I want, I want to be an artist. Like I actually need this to survive and it also, um, it felt like freedom. So I, like when I made that choice and I was at that point like in my early 30s um, and I had gone back to school in my late 20s and went through all these different sort of um, uh, majors like nutrition and psychology, um, art therapy, I then was like, oh, I have to do this. This is what I'm, this is like this gift that um, I'm meant to do. And, um, and then I made that choice and it really equaled like freedom and being able to kind of choose my own path and like make my own schedule um, and be alone and like be creative. So um, so for me it was just like, and for my family, like provide for my family and like, so it was like very much like a sort of practical and also just like feeding my soul sort of tool. Thank you, thank you both for that. Um, a similar material that you use in both of your works is glitter. Um, and I've been reading this manifesto called Glitter Festo by T.O. Cohen. So if you all want to check it out, it's available online, Glitter Festo. Um, and it really outlines the way that glitter can be performative and political um, in a lot of ways. And so I'll read just a few of the declarations from Cohen. Glitter, once you've been implicated, is impossible to shake. 
It marks you well into the future and requires that you wear it on your person, even unintentionally. It is a public declaration of affinity. Glitter-based performance is not concerned with reality, except to transform it into something more fair and fabulous. Glitter gets everywhere. It cannot be contained. So I just wanted to hear you all talk a little bit more about glitter in your work, what you're trying to communicate to the viewer, and then also if you want to talk about some of the other mediums that you all are using in your practice. Yeah, um, so glitter is, it's, um, for me, it's like a material that is very much not, not friends with the other materials that I use. I use oil paint, and so um, we were just sitting here actually talking a minute ago before um, talking with you all about uh, our studios are very, very different places. Um, I'm, I'm a very clean studio person. Uh, I kind of have to be. I remember even in grad school, uh, people would be like, how are you dressed like normal, you know, in normal clothes and there's nothing on you and you make work that has all this stuff on it. And I'm like, I kind of have to be really meticulous about everything that I do and make sure that um, glitter, which is a material that kind of, you know, it will latch onto everything else that I use. Um, so I have to, I work in a kind of, and you can kind of tell from looking at these paintings, in a paint-by-number kind of systematic way where each um, zone of the painting is uh, masked off and worked within um, section by section. So I'm working on usually something like, like for example, all five of those paintings right here were all made simultaneously. So they were all made at the exact same time. Um, and then allows different drying stages to happen so then I can do a glitter, um, glitter moment at one point uh, once everything is fully dry. So it's, um, it's very, uh, it's a material that I fight a lot with, but I've also learned how to like wrangle and I love it. Um, it's a material that dazzles, it, um, it's cheap and, um, and, and can cover a wide area. It's also, I think of it a lot like in the way that I think about the way that paint can be suspended, uh, pigment in a binder, right? It's mm -hmm. just, um, you know, a larger grade. It's, it diffracts, uh, it refracts light in this way that I think is really exciting to me. Um, and it's, uh, it disorients in some ways, like a large field of it. Um, what I love is that it changes and shifts as you walk across it. The same thing is happening with sequins or um, other, other materials, interference paint. It's the same thing that's like a, kind of glitter, it's ground up. I love mica, um, you know, natural glitters, glass that's ground up, diamond dust, which you might have seen, maybe if you've seen a lot of like Warhol prints. Um, all of them interact with light in this way that uh, makes, it demands that the work is to be viewed in person and experienced in person because mm -hmm. it, um, it is affected by time. It, le it, it makes itself known, it leaves it <laughs> a residue everywhere it goes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was showing, there was this um, one person I was talking to that uh, was telling me they um, had a paint. I mean, some, sometimes I'll seal the glitter, but it really does change it. The, um, and I think that there's something that gets lost in that sometimes. And so I, I was talking to somebody about that, um, different modes of, like, or different ways to sort of like, Again, it's like I'm always learning more about this material, how to control it, make it do what I want it to do, but like what you were just describing, yeah. it sort of doesn't. It's yeah. going to always do what it needs to do yeah. on its own, and you kind of have to like accept it. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's a craft material, it's cheap, but it has a big effect and a big yeah. impact, which I really love. When it's shipped and installed, like are there pe like glitter pieces that are coming? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I was wondering, like are we, are we gonna see some little glitter, you know? Yeah, I mean, it happens sometimes, so less and less, I mean, obviously, if you are moving them and, like, shaking them around or, like, bumping them, then, it, yeah, it'll dust off, but I usually get off most of it before it goes anywhere, mm -hmm. um, and depending on what the painting is, I'll seal the glitter yeah. completely. Um, there are ways to seal it uh, that retains its, um, the quality a little bit better, but for the most part, most mediums, when you seal over it, it kind of... Um, it just changes it. It can kind of alter the color. It can make it less uh, shimmery or it doesn't reflect the light in the same way. It sort of subdues it because then there's this film over top of everything. So it's, um, yeah, kind of ruins it for me. Yeah. Um, I love how similar our materials are, but like so different, the work. Um, and it's just, I love hearing all the, I know all those things very intimately. Um, 
I hate glitter, and um, but I, I, it's a love-hate relationship because it's like definitely on me right now. It's on my partner right now. Like I know it's everywhere all the time. So my cat in this moment, um, and so I, it just gets everywhere, um, and that is it's a lot. But um, but it's so seductive, yeah. and I just like for me it's it's it's, comp it's totally about light. It's about magic. Like I feel like I'm just just wielding magic to, like constantly um and and it draws people in um i love it and i've tried other things like i've tried ground up crystals um i mean mica and micaceous iron oxide also are really wonderful like to um use with like in tandem but it, nothing does what glitter does and so um i so i will continue to use it until i can't um, and I also think of it as like, it feels very rich, like I, it is cheap or, um, and it's just plastic, but it feels like so like luxe and abundant and it just, um, and I feel like at this point, like I really know how to use it and, um, and just create, I don't know, just like this opulence with it. Yeah. Um, and I also use abalone shell, like anything that catches light is yeah. really like with luminosity, like I, I need it yeah. to in, in order to use, to make the work. Um, yeah, I think, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I like that you use the word seduction because I think that's another commonality across your works is that you draw people in, but there's so much they have to grapple with when they get there, right? Um, thinking through ideas of queer belonging or ancestors or the transatlantic slave tra uh, trade. And so I just wanted, Elisa, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about, um, you use kind of the element of shine and glitter to draw people in, but there's also this darkness, right, when they get there that they have to deal with and grapple with, and you're exploring that darkness through a particular color palette of yeah. blues and blacks and purples. And so I was just wondering if you could talk about the, the intention behind that color palette, also in your, you know, your outfit that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, um, I mean, for me, it's really about, like, feeling, and so, like, this, like, in other works, I've used, like, different colors and um, a different palette, but with this body of work, like, the first piece that I started with is the largest work, looking backward and forward and, um, on the, this wall upstairs, and, um, and I started with the ground and its interference powder, like, blue interference with black, and just that, like, just knowing that, like, thinking about this, like, black um, medium in this blue, like, just the way my brain works, I was like, okay, thinking of black, black people in blue water, and, um, and I think I was listening to, like, 1619 at the time, and, like, the first episode, mm -hmm. I'd already made the, the, like, painted the paper, but, um, but it was just very clear, I was like, oh, this is about the water, and this is about um, the Middle Passage, and and so then I sort of just made my like I made it sort of um, I the goal was or like I gave myself a limit or like an assignment to only use um, black and blue and to kind of see what I could do with that, um, and I'm, I mean blue is like my power color also, so it's I'm very drawn to that in general, which is just like personal for me, but I, I love to see it. It feels very good, yeah. um, and that's like it's very like the way that I work is very sensory based. So like it has to feel like really like on my brain and on my body and in my hands. Um, and so I felt like it, the using those colors and limiting that palette sort of spoke to um, the story that I was trying to tell. Like I felt like it, it, it needed to like, I mean, it, there's, there's brighter colors that are more celebratory, but I wanted to feel um, heavy and somber and to communicate like a, a deep pain and also um, connection and love and 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 that's what those I mean and, and um, not just like sadness I also like an honoring yeah. um, and so that's sort of like that's what I kind of gave to myself or that assignment that I gave yeah. to myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what about textiles in your work? So you're using linen, oh, you're yeah. using velvets. Yeah, I wish I had like a more. Um, brilliant answer. I really just love, like, I, I didn't work on, um, I worked on paper mostly, okay. um, really up until, like, maybe two years ago, and um, I don't, like, stretch canvases. I'm not interested in doing that. I just, like, I love paper, okay. and 
Um, and then I was around someone who worked on linen, and I was like, oh, I like that. Just like the sound of working on linen sounded like, <laughs> felt really good. And so, like more than canvas, and it's like not, it's just the way that I am, my brain. And, and I, I did like the way it felt and the way it looked, like it just felt, it looked like, um, just like very natural and beautiful. And, um, and so the velvet, I love velvet and the way that it, it was just like a solution to sort of dealing with the linen because I didn't want to stretch it and I wanted it to feel like a tapestry or, um, and so that, that, that was like my solution to it. It was just to, um, but I, but again, it's just, it feels like rich and like very beautiful and um, accessible in this way because like, I don't know, like I would wear velvet as a kid and like, you know, just wanted something that was like familiar. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And Devin, I know you use textiles in your work too, there's some pieces over there, collage with denim, um, and also just your engagement with fashion is very present. You told me that you taught yourself how to sew for um, some earlier works that you've done. Um, so can you talk about the use of textiles and clothing um, in your works as well? Yeah, sure. Um, for me, like, shopping is a large part of my practice. Yes. I love to go shopping. <laughs> I really, um, I love clothes a lot and there's, you know, I'll go to like a fabric store and just run around and just uh, accumulate materials that I feel like could be useful in the future. I might not have a specific painting in mind. Um, sometimes I'll get things based on color or based on um, maybe it reminds me of someone in particular. Um, and so I'm really interested in how uh, using these materials, at least for me, I reach for them like I reach for paint or something. So I really do... Um, you know, I have like bins and bins and bins of just like yards of f different wow. fabrics mm -hmm. around. Um, and a lot of the times they're like brocade fabrics, they're um, sequin fabrics, um, uh, beaded things, different, mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm often in those areas where like you'll see like people making couture mm -hmm. garments and things like that will mm -hmm. shop. Um, and I think for me, I'm also thinking a lot about drag in my work. Um, I, I do think a lot about um, that sort of like construction of a fantasy through opulence or through, um, you know, certain types of materiality, materials that generally speaking will look better underneath certain lighting conditions. Like um, I always think of my paintings as, this is actually like a show, the only show that I've really done where it's like this bright in a room. Mm -hmm. um, normally I do like more high drama spotlighting in the way that you might encounter a drag performer where um, you know that kind of uh, fantasy happens when the light catches in a dark room but on the spotlit person mm -hmm. who's like, mm -hmm adorned themselves with all these glitzy materials that kind of, um, uh, I don't know, changes the way in which you're, it's, it comes alive in this way when you're walking past it, the light reflects and sort of refracts and like glints through your eyes and um, yeah, and it just like really transforms the work and so I get excited by fabrics that have all kinds of different textures and catch the light in different ways and um, yeah, and so I think a lot about uh, yeah, garmenting a lot, actually. So I did teach myself how to sew. I make these um, other, I guess I would say they're soft sculptural works where they're hoodies, basically, and they um, usually are slightly larger than life size, but I've made them up to um, something like 14 feet in wingspan mm. as well, and they're completely covered um, with silk flowers and other embellishments. Um, and those, I taught myself how to sew making those. So I, I sew the hoodie, and, um, and so I learned how to make a pattern and how to sew a hoodie in there. Um, I wouldn't wear those hoodies. <laughs> They're a little janky if you were trying to wear them, but they are, um, you know, it's something that I think is really important for me to understand at least how to construct or make a thing, even if um, later I might have it fabricated, or sometimes I might use just like a ready-made hoodie. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was really important to know how to make the foundation of the thing. Mm -hmm even if it's not mm -hmm. the end result or whatever, like um, all of these surfaces I've made, um, all these surfaces actually, and I, for the most part, still do make my surfaces, and it's, um, sometimes I'll get somebody else to make them, and when that happens, I'm always like, oh, this is so weird, now I just sit here and just mm -hmm. like, yeah. can stare at a blank surface and jump right in, but there's something about that process of um, creating the foundation of the thing that I'm gonna work on, yeah. Uh, that allows me to sort of marinate and think um, and care for and think about how the foundation of what you're 
making, um, what kind of marks can you make on that surface, knowing how intimately you've spent time prepping that surface. And so it really does determine uh, you know, the way that uh, a mark can be made, the way that, uh, how luminous the paint can feel. Um, and we were talking about glitter. Glitter refracts light in such a scattered way because each piece slightly faces a different direction. So um, the same thing can happen if your surface is too textured. So it's absorbing a lot of light and you're only actually refracting or emitting a little bit of light through the paint, whereas if you make a super slick, almost like a whiteboard smooth surface, your paint's gonna glow in this way that's really exciting. And you, it, it can feel like wet in a way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's um, different surface preparation underneath different areas of the painting yeah. as well. Yeah. I love that. And in talking about fashion and textiles and shine and glitter and all those things, they lend themselves to beauty a lot, um, which I see you all exploring in your works. Um, and I think sometimes we forget that beauty can also be political from thinking of the ways that like the beauty industry has like upheld systemic racism, issues around colorism, um, but also the way that black people have used, you know, beauty from the Afro to cornrows in these very political ways. Um, and so um, I'm a bit of a nerd, so I'm gonna read another quote uh, from literature. This is from Saidea Hartman's Venus in Two Acts, um, where she writes about beauty and she says, quote, can beauty provide an antidote to dishonor and love a way to exhume buried cries and reanimate the dead? Um, so this is a very long way of me saying, you know, how is beauty actually functioning in your work, maybe to some political effects or some personal and intimate effects as well? Um, I, like when I started making this work, I started with um, the crowns, which um, are like one of the figures in that large painting that was referencing that they have a head that's made of a crown or the large Afrocosmos. So they were like collaged um, mm -hmm. images of hair. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I, I, I imagine them as like beings mm -hmm. um, and, and they are, and then there's other ones too. But, um, and I was, my goal was to sort of um, actually make like monsters to make them very scary mm -hmm. and, um, as sort of like like thinking about black hair and the way that um, white supremacy treats blackness and black hair. And so I wanted to kind of like turn around and be like, okay, I'm gonna make like an even scary, like you're, you wanna see this as like scary or distracting or exotic or offensive. And, and instead they were really beautiful. Yeah. Like of course, right? And because of like the, because our hair is beautiful and it's, um, and it was just, yeah, like just ended up being gorgeous. And, and that's just the way that I make work. Um, like it, it is, like I am attracted to beauty and, um, and that's what like sort of, that like feeds me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like I really love when someone sees it and they don't know what they're looking at and they're like, kind of, and some people are scared and some people are, um, it's like a litmus test a little bit, you know, yeah. <laughs> to know yeah. what people think. Um, but, I, again, use it similarly to glitter, like as a way to like draw you in mm -hmm. and maybe sort of confuse you. And um, and to also like, it's an, again, like an honoring or like a way to like affirm that um, blackness is inherently beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I want, I mean, I'm not intentionally doing that all the time, but I feel like it just ends up being this very, um, yeah, like just very attractive yeah. um, imagery that draws you in. Um, and so that, yeah, it's just like a way to, to honor that again yeah. and to affirm that. Yeah. I love that because especially when you said the litmus test, because when I first encountered your work, I um, thought that they were like constellations in the sky, like they were stars. And I was just like, this is a very beautiful exploration of, of um, the themes and topics that you're exploring in your work. So I do think that, yeah, people will come away with a different reading of it. Um, and that's really incredible. What about you, Devin? Um, beauty is a, uh, a thing that I think um, it can, it's interesting. I was thinking a lot about how beauty can, I mean, it draws people in, but it also can really piss people off, I think, a lot of the time. And um, it's like, a, I think I was looking, I was talking to a friend of mine about the um, etymology of the word gorgeous, and it really gets into some dark-sided stuff if you really go back into it. And um, and it's, it's something that's actually almost repulsive. Mm. 
Uh, it's something that really draws you in, but also if you look back into the etymology of the word, it's something like dealing with like regurgitation. Um, and so it's this, uh, it's this thing that I think has this push and pull, which I think is really exciting to me. Um, I, I don't know, I, I think the, the way that I think about beauty, I guess, in, in my work is inherent in the materiality or the colors. I mean, I think about um, certain types of harmony that's happening in the work. Um, I'm using colors that I think a lot of people associate often, at least, it, you know, people are always like, oh, it's so bright and happy and all these other things, but then um, sitting with some of the works, especially some of the sculptural work, I think people are hit a little bit harder um, by that, um, being drawn in by something that they feel like was um, beautiful or drew them in because it made them feel good and then they're having to then be confronted with uh, something that maybe is a little bit darker or more difficult uh, subject matter. Um, and, and, you know, dealing and wrangling with emotions of sadness or uh, confronted with having to think about the realities of the world today. Um, but, the, but for a moment, they were distracted by pretty colors or pretty materials. And I think, um, you know, sometimes that can feel like trickery. And I think that's why I think beauty or gorgeousness can enrage or incite um, sadness or, or things like that in a way where it feels like deception. Yeah. Um, and I'm really interested in those types of, that, that switch that occurs, I think. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, and I think beauty also is something that can be celebratory and exciting all the same. So I think it's just a complicated, uh, it's a complicated thing to, to deal with it and to, to use it as a tool, especially when dealing with heavier subject matter. I mean, you're dealing with the transatlantic slave trade, but there's there are beautiful images of something. So I, I think that there's, um, I, I think beauty can be weaponized, but I think, uh, and I think that's the thing that maybe uh, people have a harder time with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. dealing with it. Thank you both for sharing. Um, because what I also see is kind of you all having such a acute awareness you know, of um, both the beauty and the joy and the heaviness of black life, right? And you're doing this particular type of imagining otherwise, this particular type of fantasizing about what if, you know? Um, and Elisa, I know that's very prominent in your work. You're thinking through um, speculative fiction. Um, and I think, you know, Notably, within the past maybe five plus years, right, a lot of people have um, returned to our, or continue to engage authors like Octavia Butler, um, Saidia Hartman, right, uh, Janelle Monet, um, all of these artists and writers who um, are thinking through, you know, how can we get to the other side, or how can we survive this space right here, right now, um, in these, you know, and find creative pro approaches to it, and so. Um, could you share a little bit about the power of um, speculative fiction or speculation in your work, but also um, in general across uh, for black folks and black contemporary artists? Um, for me, it's definitely like a way to cope and survive. Um, and yeah, things are terrible. And so I need to like imagine something different and um, sort of like meditate on this like safe space where we are protected. And I feel like that's like, that's like what drives it. It's just like imagining like that, like the other side, mm -hmm. um, like what, and it's like, I have a piece like be me on the other side mm -hmm. upstairs. And it's like, what, like to, to get over that and to like, then like, then we're free, mm -hmm. then we're safe, um, then we're loved. And like that exists here and now, but, um, but it's not all the time yeah. and it's not for everyone. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, it's very much a way to just like be able to, I mean, I, I feel like it's sort of selfish, like check out, but not like um, just to go somewhere else to be able to just, as I said, like cope or deal with what is happening in the moment. Um, and I mean, I love Janelle Monet, I love Octavia Butler. I, and I love like science fiction, I love yeah. astrofuturism, all of that. So. Um, that's, I'm definitely inspired by that. I think uh, my work is is more sort of like, I mean, I take from, I'm, you know, I've absorbed all of those like um, narratives and stories and art, but it's definitely like more intuitive based where I feel like I'm, I'm, 
I'm like less like less research based and more like what is the feeling like in my body, you know, and like where where like this is like a personal story, but like if I'm anxious or like um, like at night, I sort of imagine myself like on the bottom of the ocean, like walking, mm -hmm. and so like I mean I'm in real life terrified of the ocean. I can't swim very well, but like I, or in the sky, you know, like like flying, like I oh like it's just a way to sort of like. Um, like just go to this other place. And so, um, and I want to also give that to other people and to, to allow them to imagine um, a, a different uh, reality. And, and to a reality that we have created for ourselves mm -hmm. as black people. Mm -hmm. And it's because like we're black and, and because of our gifts and because of our bodies, like our actual, you know, like all of the, the things that are deemed negative in this world, like um, specifically by white delusion and supremacy, like we have created and we can exist in this like new future. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I see, you know, there's like this idea of like also creating belonging, right? Yeah. In community, yeah, yeah. Um, which I also see present in your work, Devin, and thinking about um, queer belonging, right, and, and space making. Um, here you, in this body of work here, you've imagined yourself as Patti LaVille and Left Eye and Aaliyah, which is incredible. And as you mentioned, you know, you, you include yourself in your works a lot of times as well. I know you also have some works about um, kind of a fictional um, women's R&B group, right? Um, so I just wanted to know if you see self-portraiture at all as a form of kind of imagining a different space or a fantasy, um, or just how you see self-portraiture in general in your practice? Yeah, um, I love uh, speculative fiction as well. Like, I read a lot of it. Um, and I also think that, uh, so I don't know, there's something that about self-portraiture for me is like this thing where I'm not thinking so much of like, like this is a this is technically me, but I don't necessarily. It doesn't need to be me necessarily. Mm -hmm. I think that it's um, it's it's like I'm using my own body as this kind of like archetypal character that then kind of explores a multitude of things. It could be anybody. If I had another person that just could be on hand at any time mm -hmm. to just mm -hmm. pose for me, I would do that too. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I do think that part of it. I you know I say that, but then I also do think a lot about. Um, you know, we talked a lot about beauty before and I think about how my own journey with like s loving myself and mm -hmm. how I my physical appearance and um, you know I talk a lot with other people about their you know being queer and black and um, you know I'm like I'm skinny and tall taller and like kind of like being a kid dealing with that um, mm -hmm. was like you know body image stuff everybody has that mm -hmm. and so you know a lot of um, making this work uh, helps me to, I, I don't really shy away from showing, like, or rendering my likeness in um, how I actually really do believe that I look. <laughs> and, um, and then I also am embellishing myself in this way where mm -hmm. parts of it do obscure some of my features. Yeah. Um, but then also, at the same time, I'm embellishing in this way to sort of um, add these other elements in the way that sometimes I'll dress really, um, I usually wear way more jewelry than I'm wearing right now. It's like very toned down. Um, but like, yeah, there's ways that I embellish my own body or use fashion to sort of not necessarily distract, but to accent and to, um, draw. it's like, in some ways I used to think that I was doing it to, um, like as a kid I dressed really weird, like on purpose, really weird. And I used to think like, oh, this is a way for me to sort of like, embrace that I feel like I'm weird looking, mm -hmm. and then maybe people will leave me alone if I dress really weird. <laughs> but what really ended up happening was people were just like looking at me way more. Yeah. And then, um, <laughs> so, and then, you know, now I feel like people look at me a, a lot. I mean, I have, you know, big hair, and it gets, this is like day one of wash day, so it's actually pretty small right now. So, you know, I'm being stared at a lot, and, and I wear like shiny things, and I wear bright colors, or like a lot loud patterns, and, mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, in a way, it's uh, simultaneously, it's like, it feels like an armor, but it also feels like something that's drawing people in. Mm -hmm. So it's doing that duality that I'm talking about a lot, and it happens a lot in my paintings, too. It's this thing where it is me, but it's not me. Mm -hmm. um, I get to imagine myself in so many different um, ways. Um, I love um, fiction and the limitless possibilities of it. And mm -hmm. so for me, these paintings, it's, um, it's me in very light drag, I guess you could say, in some ways, like I'm um, really just 
popping different wigs on top of my head, essentially, in these paintings. But um, yeah, it's, it's embracing a femininity in me that um, was very much present and still very much is in this way that I, I fantasize about um, being um, effeminate in this way uh, where I can just um, you know, make a change like that, put on a wig, um, put on a high gloss lip and really just feel empowered and excited by that and wear a ton of jewelry. And, and um, yeah, so it's a way for me to dip into that type of fictional version of myself and maybe sometimes I'll be able to do that yeah. um, in real life if I want to. But uh, for now, it's like in the painting and it feels good there too. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, sometimes I think a lot about uh, the sort of like secondary effect of making a lot of self-portraiture is having to wrangle with the idea of I think this painting looks really good and looks beautiful, but also that's me. Mm -hmm. And like that's like a really like that's like a really complex thing um, to like love yourself is like kind of crazy. So yeah, it's just like a yeah, like I don't know. It's a, it's a learning process of loving myself and that feels like yeah. really complicated and really good and also sometimes it feels really strange and disorienting and um, out of body in some ways but yeah that's thank you so much for sharing so much about yourself I really appreciate it um, and while we're on the topic of self uh, my final question for you all before we open it to audience Q&A uh, what's next for you all what's something that you haven't explored in your work yet that you're excited to explore Devin knows this, but I'm trying to get him to do like a fashion collaboration or something so we can get some clothes. But um, yeah, what's what's next for you all? What are you what are you excited to explore? I'm excited to explore. I think like a lot of my work is thought about like off planet or like in the water. So like um, thinking about like on Earth, like what like a, a kind of different leg of the story um, and looking again like back in history which wasn't like my intention initially but I like the idea of um, looking back and and reimagining mm -hmm. um, and reconfiguring different stories of survival and so um, I'm yeah I have something brewing that has to do with spe specifically like beings on earth mm -hmm. which yeah I haven't really done oh, wow. yeah um, well, right now I'm starting to uh, work on the rest. So these two paintings here are tarot card compositions. Um, that's uh, Death and this is Temperance. Um, I am continuing making all of the major arcana um, as paintings the same scale. And so I have another, uh, right now, these are two. I've already made two other ones. I've made the star and I've made the moon. Um, so I have 18 more to go. Oh and so my goodness. And so, um, so I'm working uh, through that as like a body of work that hopefully I'll be able to show all of them together. Mm -hmm. And I'm really, um, I also, like we said earlier, I would love to make clothing. I, I think about it all the time. I draw all the time for that. I make a lot of sketches um, for clothing specifically. And also I'm making some pretty exciting big sculptures, which Ooh. is gonna be really cool. But. Um, yeah, I, you know, like my first project that I ever did that was, that was working with a fabricator really was um, in, in a, like a substantial amount was this project in DC at the Smithsonian. And so now it's a little less scary, that yeah. process. Um, and so now I'm working on some other types of sculptures that manifest in like, um, that are more figurative. Yeah. And yeah, I'm excited for that. Yeah, I'm excited for both of you. Thank you so much for being in conversation with me. Thank um, you. I enjoyed it so much, and now I think we're going to open it up to audience Q&A.